Hi, my name is Carrie Barnum. I am the Executive Director of New Shelves Books, and we are here for Free Advice Friday, the hour every Friday at 10 a.m. where we get together as publishers, writers, freelancers to just talk about publishing and writing and everything having to do with books and book marketing. We're so glad you joined us. We do take questions live on Zoom. To register for that, just go to newshelves.com slash F-A-F. And we also take questions in via email. So if you can't make it at 10 a.m. Eastern, I know we have some West Coasters who aren't into getting up early, and I don't blame you. So you can email those in always at questions with an S at free advice Fridays with an S dot com. And without getting into any more detail, let's hop into the questions here. Let me see. Do you or any of your clients have experience in using the customization feature with Ingram Spark? They have a little link that you can click on to customize your order. Apparently, you can upload a signature or graphics. How does this work? Is it worth it? Has anyone else writing any articles about how they used it? Um, I have heard about it, David. I remember uh, when it came out, getting like that notification, but I've never personally used it um with the customizing of your order i don't know if anyone else has if you have drop your experience in the chat we can talk about it um but if not i will go look into it this week and then you may have just inspired a new blog post um so we'll look into that if no one else has heard about it i will not heard about it but actually used it it's just not a feature that i've been using right there on ingram spark i love that when you guys are like well I need to know about this. It makes me go learn, go learn things. Oh, let's see. All right, Denise, you're asking about how to get the rank of best-selling authors on Amazon. Are you looking for best-selling in a category? Are you looking for best-selling on all of Amazon for a book, for an author? Let me know because there's lots of best-selling options on uh, Amazon. So let me know and we'll cover that one. Let's see. <laughs> what is the best way to get sponsored ad on the first line at Amazon when you are doing books? So a sponsored keyword ad is when you, or a sponsored ad is when you are paying to get your book in a search term. And the best way to get your book at the top there, have great search or category keyword terms and up your budget. I mean, that's what it is. When we're doing a sponsored keyword ad on Amazon for our books, these things are going by bids. We put in our top bid amount and then every time someone goes to search, the little bots go to work. And I completely in my head picture this like an auction house where they're like auctioning really quick with like, I don't know, they're like little like fleas in my mind. It's so weird. My mind is a crazy place. But anyway, so it's this little auction that happens really quickly. And um, whoever has the highest bid, that is of course preset when you set your ads up, that's who wins the top spot. And so a lot of that depends on your bid. Um, I have seen some of these top spots, they can go for as inexpensively as 25 cents, 17 cents even. However, for the big keywords, if you are doing thrillers, if you are doing, um, let's say, Lee Child or one of the really big names, those top spots can go for a dollar or more. So just keep that in mind as well. Is it worth it? Would I pay, I would pay a dollar all day long if one keyword every time I got clicked got me a sale. Of course I would because a dollar to sell a $16.99 book, yes. However, that rarely happens. And so if you're paying... Typically in the industry, we look for one purchase out of every 10 clicks. So if you're paying a dollar for a click, then that's $10 to sell a $16.99 book. Then you still have to take out print costs. You're not really making any money there. So you kind of have to look at the give and take. I have found that it's better to find your niche keywords and try to get at the top of those searches. Um, so instead of saying thriller, do you have a, um, a serial killer thriller? Do you have a, uh, a Memphis serial killer? Do you have, what kind of keywords can you use that people may realistically be searching that aren't the first thing 
everyone thinks of. And that tends to work a lot better off for the, the ads I run and the clients I work with than just upping our budget out enormously. Um, I totally just added two words together and made my own word. And so that's what I'd be looking at. If you just want to get on the top, up your budget. If you want to get on the top and not spend a ton of money and actually get some better conversion, get to thinking creatively and find those comps. And don't be afraid to go for the comps that are selling but aren't best sellers. So is there, all right, LT Ryan, for example, LT Ryan is a big name. He's selling a lot in thrillers. Um, and so those keywords I learned at him recently, uh, top spots can go for like two, two bucks crazy. So maybe I don't want to go for LT Rhyme, but can I find someone who's got that same audience who's selling books and who is ranking high and rating well, but instead of like selling that many and having thousands of reviews, can I find another indie author who's selling like 50 a week instead of, you know, 5,000 a week? How can you work with and kind of, I hate to call it piggybacking because we're just borrowing an audience. We're not stealing it, but how can we really work with to uh, our other indies who are doing well? Because what happens is if that indie is marketing themselves, if that person who's doing well, but isn't LT Ryan is marketing themselves and drawing people to their books, well, then you're essentially kind of benefiting off of their marketing simply by finding them and making them a keyword because it's a good comp. It's a, it's a selling comp, but it's not a comp that's like New York Times bestseller. Not everyone has heard of them. And sometimes you actually get a much better um, ACOS or your actual cost of sale through that and you get more return on your investment there. Let's see, I recently published a 32 page picture book on KDP. There were two blank pages at the end. An editor recommended to publish the next book in the series with 31 pages to avoid these blank pages. Have you heard of that? Uh, typically when printing, you have to have even number of pages. So 31 pages, not so much, it would be 32. Now, if you purposely put a blank page in the back of it, that may work. Um, so it wouldn't be 31 pages, it'd be 31 pages with a blank page, making it 32. Um, so it, it just depends um, on that. And so what it is, is your printers though, they add in that page. And sometimes they're adding that page because they have a barcode or brand. Um, it's very, it is very common. It's the printer and the printer does it. It's not really an issue. It's not uncommon. Um, I actually have, let me just see if there's one in the back of this book. There might even be more than one. Yeah, see? All right, so I have this lovely edition of American, uh, America's Bilingual Century. It's beautiful, hardcover. Uh, if you're into languages or learning why languages should be important to you and why you should teach them to your kids, uh, you should totally check it out. But in the back here, so this is in the back of the book, number one, See if I've got it high enough. Number one, this is from the printer. They're printing this here, so they're adding a page for that, right? Mind you, text ends here with the about the author. So then they've got this page. Then they're adding even more pages. Look, there's another course. They're gonna be stuck. It's because I'm on here. I told you guys I'm having, I'm having that kind of week. So then there's another page, and there's actually another page stuck to it, and it's just stuck and it's not coming off. But it's not a problem. No one looks at that and is like, wow, why is that there? Um, because it's just not a problem. And a lot of times people will take notes on there or inscriptions or all sorts of things. So I wouldn't worry about it too much. It's just something the printer does. And it is based on uh, each specific printer, the specs they do. Sometimes they only do uh, things that are divisible by four. Sometimes it's two, sometimes it's eight depends on the printer, and they add in blank pages to make that happen. So, no big deal there. Let's 
Let's see, how can you figure what the other Indies keywords and prices are? So we can't figure out other uh, Indies keywords specifically when we're trying to run ads and find comps, but we can find who's selling. Do we know their actual sales numbers? Not unless you have special stuff. I have a set of tools. Um, I'm happy to get you a link, but I have a set of tools that actually um, scrapes the data and pulls that information out so you can see the average sales and all that kind of stuff. Um, so there are things that allow you to look for that. But if you don't want to pay for software, if you're just looking, all you have to do is go to the bestseller lists, go look on the top 100 bestseller lists in your category and find the books that are doing great that aren't from major houses. And you'll be able to tell because instead of, you know, a thousand reviews, this guy's going to have 50. Um, and find the people who are consistently ranking. And that is what I would recommend. That's cheap, easy, free way to do it. Cheap. It's free. It's not cheap. Uh, let's see. All right. Let me see. Hi, Caroline. I always call you Caroline because I see it. It does, it does. American Bilingual Century does look very beautiful. The colors really popped. And I'm fairly sure, Caroline, you can confirm for me, but I'm pretty sure I get questions all the time about the quality of Ingram Sparks printing and their covers. And I am fairly sure that this is a Ingram Spark print book. Um, and the colors are really great. It's a nice matte, which I like. Matte is definitely trending for book covers right now. Um, it's got the really rich blue. The red looks great. The white is not scuffed. I know that's a concern that comes up a lot. Um, but I think that it is, I think it's awesome. I think the printing is great. The page, um, it's definitely cream paper, but the page um, texture is great. It's not too thin, but it's not thick. Um, so as far as the quality of Ingram Spark, I don't have it next to me, of course, but um, I have a traditionally published book that I'm sure was off some print that I just got uh, recently, and it's absolutely same, like, I would never, okay, let's be honest, I would notice the difference, but no one is going to sit there and judge your books like I do. And I say this with all love. And this is super cool too, because you can actually have your entire, you can print on the cover as well. So even with the dust jacket off, it's here and then see it's on the back. Isn't it so pretty? And so we've got the spine. So this is cool as well. You can do kind of totally just hit myself in the face with the book. Um, so you can do like that printed cloth cover kind of look with just the spine uh, printed on it. You can do that or you can do like a full print. And I mean, it's really cool. It's amazing the things that digital printing has turned into and how beautiful it looks. And um, so if you've wondered about Ingram Sparks printing, at least for this book, I think they are awesome for print on demand and not having to do thousands of dollars offset print um, for sure. Uh, thank you. It's a good deal here. All right. There we go. I'm going to not ruin my, my copy of that book. All right. Okay. Let me see. Where's the best place to look for guidelines on standalone quote permissions? Has anyone had any particularly good or not so good experience with this? Um, are you talking about quotes from books, quotes from movies? Usually you just have to cite it. Um, an editor would have uh, excellent information for sure, but typically as long as you're citing, as long as you are using a short quote and it's not trademarked, which most of the stuff is not. I mean, unless you've got a phrase that Oprah says and you're using that, um, but yeah, one line, as long as you're quoting it and you're giving, um, you're saying who wrote it, it's not usually a problem. Um, watch out for anything that's new that's trademarked. So let's say, um, I'm trying to think of someone that has something trademarked and I can't. Uh, like I said, let's say Oprah trademarked um, 
something. Uh, you get one. Oprah trademarked you get one and you put that in your book. Well, that could be a problem because it's trademarked, but otherwise uh, that's not um, as hard. And yes, Tara makes a great point. Make sure that you are careful about researching. Do not go to Brainy Quotes. Please do not rely on just any online site. Go to an actual book, work with a librarian, work with a uh, official site, a EDU site, something like that. Make sure that you have got good, um, good research behind whoever you are giving uh, a quote to. <laughs> Brainy Quotes says every quote pretty much is anonymous, and we don't want to do that, so be careful with that. Absolutely. And Tara, I love this is putting quote investigator.com as being a good one to put up there. <laughs> David, if in doubt, leave it out. Uh, yes, leave it out if it's really doubtful. But if you're just asking in general, don't be afraid to use quotes. All right. Yeah. Um, so we have someone asking about Amazon Smile. And for those who don't know, Amazon Smile is their, um, it's a nonprofit organization program where you can set up a nonprofit. And when people use this link to order from Amazon, or they say that they would like to link with this organization, they get a donation on every order. So if you have a nonprofit, this can be great. Um, you do have to apply through Amazon Smile. I believe, I've never done this myself, but I believe that they have a form you do have to send in tax forms and prove that it's nonprofit um, and all of that kind of thing. And you do have to set it up so that those funds go directly there, I believe. So yes, any customer can set their preferred nonprofit. So let's just say today, Let's do our good deed of, of the week because I need some good karma. And if you are shopping on Amazon, go for, I don't care if you know who it is or you support that person personally, go find someone on Amazon Smile and select them as the person that you want your donations to go to. It doesn't cost you anything. Amazon does it. So just by when you're making your normal purchases, they are giving that person um a little bit of a donation. It's a absolutely awesome program. I think it's kind of underutilized or under talked about. Um, so anyone can do it and it's great. Um, yeah, it can be anyone and it's great. So you can absolutely set that up though. You just do have to fill out the forms and all of that. Sorry, I'm reading stuff as I'm reading stuff. Oh, that's good. Amazon lets you know annually how much money you've donated, and it's very motivating. Um, Mary, I don't need any motivation to buy more things on Amazon. My husband might kill me. My UPS guy is like my buddy. I'm like, oh, hey, Tom, how are you? Poor guy. Um, I do provide cold drinks in the summer. Yes, and start at smile.amazon.com, not at amazon.com. So you do have to start. It's a special web link, essentially, that's got a tag in the HTML. So just save that on your Amazon account. All right. Okay. Uh, pricing on Ingram Spark for print. So print on hardcover is higher, but it's not, no, it's not outrageous. It is higher than, of course, if you were doing paperback or if you were doing offset print. But a mistake I see all the time is people choose the premium color for their average book or even a children's book. So when you're looking at premium color, it's just more saturated color. And will you see a difference? Probably. I mean, yes, you will see a difference between the, the normal color and the premium color. However, premium color really only matters when you've got a photo book, when you've got a cookbook, and you've got the detail of a, a dish that you really want to stand out. For the most part, in children's books and, and your average book, you don't need premium color. And that cuts the cost in like half. 
So keep that in mind as well when you're setting things up. I know that's a question we get a lot. Is premium color worth it? For some books, yeah. I mean, if you have a close-up of a salad dish and you want the greens to be vibrant, you want the reds to pop, then yes, it's worth it. But if you have a children's book and those kids are going to be flipping through, I mean, they're not like, hmm, this is kind of more chartreuse than yellow. I promise they're not. My kids aren't. Anyway, maybe other kids are, are more advanced than mine, but. All right. All right, someone's asking about uh, the Universal Breakthrough Magazine. I've not heard of this magazine. Um, let's see, a book mentioned in their New York Times campaign. Have you ever heard of this? Um, no, I've never heard of this company. So let's start there. I've never heard of this magazine or this company. If you haven't and they're messaging you, I always say beware. If you have not signed up for someone's new newsletter, if you don't know who they are and they are messaging you out of the blue, beware. Um, as far as a book mentioned in a New York Times campaign, what does that mean? Like, did they get, uh, I have seen before where someone will get a advertising spot and then they will then break it up into pieces and they will sell out the pieces. I was just looking at my copy of um, Forward magazine this week and there was a whole page from a um, a the uh, hybrid publisher we'll call them and so it was a whole page from the hybrid publisher and i know for a fact because i've worked with their authors before that what they do is that they buy a whole page and then they break it up and say hey we can fit 10 books on this page let's break it up and sell it to people um so they make a little bit of money on the top and then the authors can get advertising in Forward Magazine a little bit less expensive because rather than paying for an ad that may, let's say $300, they get a whole page for a thousand and they charge each author, let's say 150. So the company makes 50, the author gets a deal on a smaller spot and Forward gets their advertising stuff. So I've seen that before. But again, if they are approaching you out of the blue, you don't know who they are or you have not, you know, if you don't know who they are, um, be be wary. Um, a mention in New York Times again. Is it is it actually a mention in New York Times? Is it like the sidebar of their um, of an article on I don't know cicadas? Is it like where, what, how much? All of these things are things I typically look at. Um, because sometimes people be like, I can get you in the New York Times in the bug section. And I'm like, great. My romance readers are definitely going to be reading up on the habits of earthworms. So that will be very helpful to me. Um, and believe it or not, I mean, sometimes that's what happens. And uh, I was absolutely being sarcastic about it being helpful because obviously um, most, most romance readers, let's just say that most of them, and I'm completely profiling, they're not going to be reading the bug section. I don't think there is a bug section, but if there were, so. Okie dokie. Oh, is anyone else having uh, delayed responses from Ingram Sparks support. I have a title that has been in revision for days. Unusual, they are mostly efficient, but no longer offer the chat support. Yes, so we're hearing a lot of that, of delay responses um, from Ingram Spark. And part of that is they have just dialed back on their customer support. I've talked about this before. They were giving so much support. I'm not saying this is you, David, but they were giving so much support for people who just didn't know what they were doing and needed, they needed consulting. They needed an expert. And instead, because they don't want to pay for it, they were trying to get that information out of Ingram Spark support, which was taking a lot of time. It was costing the company a lot of money and they weren't getting a return on I mean, they make their money from printing. And when you help someone upload a book and they sell 50 copies in a year, this company's not making enough money to pay for consultants and support. And so what they did is they're like, all right, we're gonna just reel back that customer service and not do nearly as much anymore. And so it stinks because um, 
you know, it means that they dialed back on a lot of things. And so I am hearing more and more that it's taking a little bit longer for support to work. Seven to 10 days on average is kind of the thing that I've been hearing. Um, so I don't know if it's been longer than that. You can always send in an email to them, uh, especially if your book's been in revision. Usually that's something that goes through pretty quickly. So if you have files that you've used before, you may email them. Um, I've heard you can Facebook message them from Facebook and might get a response there as well. Let's see. Yeah, Jean, if you didn't reach out to them, um, I, I would not be jumping on board with that. Yeah. Are you saying an author can get advertising in the New York Times near book section? So let's talk advertising price. Uh, you can get advertising in almost any magazine. You can get in the New York Times. You can get into women's health. You can get into just about anything. But if you're going for a straight advertising block, especially for print magazines, we're talking thousands of dollars not tens of thousands, sometimes it's, it's 200,000 to get like a half a page or a quarter of a page in a big, in a big magazine. So you can, it's not typically, um, it doesn't typically make financial sense unless you're a huge company. However, you can get in advertising for let's say Kirkus Magazine or Forward Magazine, which are more book and publishing focused. And you can absolutely do that. And it's cheaper, still not cheap, but it's cheaper. So you can do that and get in front of book buyers and publishers. Um, as far as the big web are the big things, New York Times, Women's Health, a lot of them also offer online advertising and that tends to be much cheaper where they're putting you up on their website, but cheaper doesn't still mean cheap. It could still be $5,000. Depends on the site, how many unique visitors they get a day, their, um, you know, how well they're known, all of those kinds of things. So Advertising is absolutely for sale. That doesn't mean that it makes sense or that the cost will justify, or that, you know, getting it out there will justify the cost. Just depends. Let's see. I'm trying to get all rights reversed for my picture book. There is no termination clause in the contract I signed. Uh, after many years, five awards and selling over 50,000 copies, my publisher liquidated off to someone. My illustrator and I own the intellectual property. What do you recommend? Um, well, that's a toughie because if your contract doesn't have any termination clause, all you can do really, as far as I know, I'm no lawyer. First off, <laughs> go to the experts and that would be a lawyer, someone who is an expert in copyright and in usage rights and things like that. So let's say that, but I would start with looking at simply making an offer or um, something along those lines. If this is not currently a top selling book, if it's something that you want to get the rights back to, um, you've got to start with an offer or an ask with the person who currently owns that right. Um, so I would be looking there, but also go to an expert, go to a lawyer. Um, that is their domain. So I have ideas, but my ideas are sometimes crazy. And so I would absolutely go to the experts on that one. Look, the puppy is stirring. Oh, just kidding. He just kind of like fell back over into his bed. All right. Yes. Let's see. All right. Let's see. Uh, will you talk about the order and reasons for sequence of uploading ebook, hardcover, audio, and paperback to Ingram and Amazon before a launch and the, ramica and the ramifications of pre-order on Amazon? So your upload 
<laughs> it used to be um, a year or two back where you really had to be careful about where you uploaded first, Ingram Spark or KDP, because they were putting blocks on each other, which was not totally legit or above board, but they were putting blocks on each other. So if you uploaded your book to KDP, then Ingram Spark would be like, hey, you can't use that ISBN, which is not true. If you have an ISBN for your paperback, you can use it anywhere and everywhere, and you should. Um, so we're not running into that anymore. They got that straightened out. So that's not a concern, but you still upload your books and every platform has their own little quirks. So for your paperback, paperback, you can upload to both KDP and Ingram Spark for print on demand, and you can set them and not actually make them live. So you can order proofs, you can have them ready to go and you can upload them and you're all good you can do pre-order for your paperback on Ingram Spark. You set a future publication and sale date, and what it does is it will just put it on a pre-order. I'm doing lots of hands here. Um, on KDP though, there is no pre-order for your paperback. It will not allow you to do that. What happens though is if you do a pre-order on Ingram Spark, it will populate over to Amazon and you will have a pre-order for your paperback there. So that's your paperback. And you can do a pre-order. You cannot do a pre-order. Pre-orders do count for things like USA Today. Uh, if you do a USA Today push, let's say, which let's keep in mind that USA Today, you're looking at upwards of 5,000 copies in a single week if you want to make that list. We're talking near the bottom of the list. Um, so if you want to do that, if that's your big push, they do count pre-orders um, with the into the week of the sale. So whenever your book launches, all those pre-orders hit, and they do count for things like USA Today. Um, pre-orders for your paperback, it's fine. You don't want your paperback to languish. You don't want it to look old before it's ever out. So unless you are marketing, unless you're driving traffic, unless you are have it up for a reason, it's not something we usually recommend. Now, if you're doing blog tours, if you are pitching bookstores and libraries and trying to get them to order your book before it comes out, get that paper back up. They need to be able to see it. So doing it with an intention is kind of the thing there. For your hardcover, if you're doing a hardcover, you would use Ingram Spark, same process. You can do a pre-order on there and all the same thing. So I won't repeat myself. Um, for your ebook. Ebook is a little bit different. You're uploading typically to KDP for Amazon. They do allow a pre-order for your ebook on Amazon. I don't recommend it and I'm going to tell you why. A pre-order for your ebook I typically don't recommend because as soon as your book goes online, your ebook goes online in Kindle for pre-order, Amazon starts tallying up your rank. So hitting new release, like um, bestseller in Southern fiction, uh, top bestseller new release. Those start happening immediately. You've got 30 days for that to hit. So if you put your book up and you want to hit the new release bestseller and get that pretty orange banner, you have to be driving traffic and sales to a pre-order. Pre-orders are harder to get. If you're not a well-known author, if people haven't been waiting for your book, um, we like instant gratification. I want to click the button and them to say, okay, it's in your Kindle. And then I can start reading it immediately at 1 a.m. And that doesn't happen with a pre-order. So it's harder to do. So if you're not driving the sales, if you're not driving the traffic, what happens is Amazon starts you like on a level playing field and then your book sits and maybe it's got an order, but slowly it starts to do this. Yeah. Yeah, maybe people are in it. No one's really going to the site. Oh, they're not ordering. They're going to the book and they're not ordering. Um, and so it kind of tanks the algorithm and that's what we don't want. So if you're doing a pre-order for your ebook, you really have to work to push the marketing, to push the sales ahead of time. I've seen this done successfully. Order the ebook and you get a, you know, pre-order the ebook between these dates and get it. Um, this special download or this access or that access. I have seen it done successfully. However, it's much harder to do. And we don't want to tank our algorithms because we want the algorithms to love us. So when your book is alive and people start purchasing, you are shown all over Amazon to their millions of searchers and viewers and so that you can rank high in your categories. 
So that's why I don't recommend a pre-order for your ebook on Amazon. Um, ebooks everywhere else you can still do. Typically, you would upload to draft to digital. You can also use Ingram Spark for your ebook distribution. They have upped their game in the last couple of months, but I still I prefer draft to digital. They're easy to use, um, and I like what they offer. So completely up to you, but you can also do a pre-order on there. This pre-order, if you're not choosing Amazon, there's options. You can use distribution through them for Amazon and everywhere else, or you can get rid of Amazon, not do Amazon. That's what I recommend. So you can do a pre-order for your book and it would go out to, let's say, barnesandnoble.com, Apple, Kobo, things like that. Um, you still want it to do well. You still want great reviews on iBooks, but Amazon is, they are the, the gorilla in the room. And so we don't worry about that as much with the algorithms and all of that with pre-order. But again, do you want it to languish up online if you're not doing something with it? You don't want your sales site to get stale before you really start to use them. So do it with purpose. Let's say, Let's say just not that this happened this week, but let's say that accidentally an ebook goes up online for pre order or book goes up online for pre order earlier than you anticipated. You did not plan to have your ebook up on sale for pre order and it happened to go up there. And what do you do? I mean, how can you make the most of it? You drive traffic. You can do a discounted price for pre-order to try to drive traffic and hit that new release um, top seller so you can get the orange banner and you can kind of rank well in the algorithm to start with. You can drive pre-orders with advertising, with your um, blog tours, with your social media, with your friends and family. You can drive traffic by offering a freebie download. So um, if you're fiction, do you have recipes in your book? If you have women's fiction, do you have recipes? Can you create a PDF download of like a cookbook uh, that's like a, you know, title of the book cookbook that you can offer if people pre-order and send you proof? Um, if you're nonfiction, do you have something that you could offer another short book? What do you have that people might be willing to go and pre-order for? And so it's not the end of the world. You have to shift and you have to kind of change what you're doing, but you can make it work for you. Be intentional. And that's what it's all about is being intentional, knowing, know your situation. We're Bob Ross. We're just going to make happy little accidents. We're going to make some trees, some birds. It'll be, all be fine, but you have to be intentional and know what you're going after. So there are, I remember my first week of working with Amy Collins we had someone who's very upset, very upset about something that happened and was just out of everyone's hands. And I remember Amy turning to me and she goes, you know, there are no book emergencies. There just aren't. There are things that you shift. There are things that don't go according to plan, but it's not an emergency. No one's dying. We can do this. We can make the most of it and we can make it fabulous. And we did then. And I think that anyone can do that. Um, you can absolutely shift. It's all about how you take control of it and what you do with it. And audio, I will say audio takes the longest, the longest. If you want your audio to be ready when your book launches, start way ahead of time. Uh, put that thing up for pre-order, put it up for order early. Uh, audio, especially getting to other sites, like if you're using Findaway, getting it out onto uh, Amazon, getting it out onto Overdrive, it just takes a while for everything to sync up. So audio is one of those things that doesn't necessarily happen with the group of paperback, hardcover, and ebook on the same platforms because it's either ACX or Findaway Voices typically. Um, but get that going early or plan a separate launch for it. Either one is fine, um, but audio takes a long time. So just know that audio, you have to kind of take deep breaths, maybe have a glass of wine and realize that audio is like that errant toddler that's kind of going to do what they want and you just have to herd them along uh, like, uh, you know, angry kittens and it kind of happens. Yeah, six weeks. Caroline's saying... Uh, that it's taking about six weeks for audio. And I've seen six weeks or longer. 
in an ideal timeline or lead time for your audio, you want to have that ready. You want it ready for approval to push out to all of your platforms about six weeks ahead of time, which means that you have to start months in advance finding your narrator, reading, and all of that. It's definitely one of those things that you plan out for an audio, for sure. Let me see. Yes, yeah, six weeks just to get it posted. Exactly. Exactly, exactly. Um, all these great questions. ISBN question. I started a paperback in CreateSpace ages ago, but didn't publish. Now I'm trying to print that book through KDP and they say that ISBN has been used, which it hasn't. Any way to get around this, you can appeal directly to KDP and say that book, that that ISBN was never assigned and never used. It depends on the rep you get. Sometimes you'll get someone going, oh, I can clear that for you. And then the next person you get says, I can't do anything. Uh, you may just be out an ISBN. Um, unfortunately, that was one of the things that kind of happened with CreateSpace. If you didn't really make the book live, but you had it, um, you may just be out of it. But I would appeal to KDP and ask them, um, kind of say it was never live. It, it never went live. And if it was, then it would be up on, you would be able to search it on Crates or on Amazon because books never go away on Amazon. So, you know, try that one. Yeah, do you know any way around this other than hours of my life on hold with KDP support, listening to the terrible hold music? So funny story, Caroline and I were on a three-way call with Amazon support and we were being put on hold and this really awful loud music was playing and she was like, is there a way, I mean, we're still on the phone trying to talk to each other. Is there any way not to have that hold music on? And this very nice gentleman goes, no, I'm so sorry, there's not. So we were just kind of yelling over the music. It was awesome. Um, email them, write them when possible, send in a written re request. It doesn't always work for sure, but send in a written request, make it as clear and as detailed as possible. Um, because the written requests actually get handled very well in many cases. So I always start with a written request before I do a phone call, but I am, <laughs> some days I'm just anti-phone. I, uh, I Zoom, I call people a lot, but if I can send an email sometimes, it'll save us all time. That's right, always holding for something, except for life, we're just taking life, David. All right, what's the audiobook cost approximately? Caroline, that the audiobook prices vary widely. It depends on your narrator. Are you narrating yourself? It depends on if you are recording yourself or if you are going to recording studio. Um, I've seen people do audiobooks for as little as, let's say, $500. I've seen people do audiobooks for as expensive as $6,000 and up. So it really depends on just like in self-publishing, how much are you doing? How much are you doing? Uh, how much are you doing? How much are you contracting out? And that for sure is a thing. I would say that if you're interested in doing an audiobook yourself, Derek Dobker has a great course that talks about it and gives you all the helpful tips and tricks and all the things you need to know about it. Um, let me see. I think we had a training up from Derek on that. All right. So this is an older, a little bit of an older training, but you can absolutely go read it. The um, link should still be good. If you want the course, you should be able to link on that and check out his course as well. So that is actually, that's a back end link, you guys. So you're super special and getting special treatment, but you can go there and you can watch Derek's entire webinar training on uh, audiobooks, which was super great. Yep. And so Julia is saying, if you're using find away voices, plan on approximately $2,500 for 80,000 words. Let me see. 
Yes. Uh, yeah. So Jean, Amy, and we talked about this a little bit last week. Amy is um, working as an agent at Talcott Notch and she's working there and uh, she still owns new shelves for the time being. Uh, we are in the middle of, I say negotiations, like it's a, like it's a real strict business deal. Amy and I are in the works of actually, I will be buying new shelves from her hopefully this summer. So, um, still friends, still, she's still amazing. We still talk actually probably every day, but we are in the process of switching that out. So she is going to work as a literary agent and travel around in her RV. She's living her best life and it's a great thing. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Yeah, it's been in the works for a little while, but it's getting closer to official. All right. Tara, I read an interesting article from the School Library Journal earlier this week about how middle grade books are actually targeted to younger than middle school children. So if you had a book that's geared towards middle schoolers, middle grade is a little too young, but the next genre is YA. How do you properly position the book for the right readers? I agree with, <laughs> look at me, super important. Carrie Ray Barnum is going to agree with, you know, School Library Journal. Um, I agree with them, but only in part, actually. I think that some books are, that you would call middle grade, are geared younger. But here's why. Kids reach a certain level. When, when kids are young and they're looking at picture books, they like to read about kids their age. They like to be like, they like to see themselves in it. As kids get a little bit older, as they get into, let's say, second grade, we start to see a shift in children where they want to read about older kids. They want to discover the mysteries of middle grade when they're in third and fourth grade because it's this bright, open, exciting world. And the idea of, oh my goodness, a crush or um, big life events, they want that. They want that, and that is why when we think of middle grade books that feature middle grade children, we're seeing younger kids a few years back read them. I will also say that when we get into middle grade, let's say we've got our 12 and 13 year olds, 12, 13, 14 year olds, which is technically middle grade, these people are actually reading books about 17, 18 year olds. They are reading young adult. Why? The same reason. Uh, because they are still in this awesome blush of youth where they can't wait to get to the next step. And with books, it's, a, it's an open door. It's a discovery process. And that's what books offer them. And so they're reading up. And then we get to the point where, you know, we're like, great, I turned 21, then I turned 30. Let me start reading the young adult again. I don't really need to read up anymore. But kids aren't there yet. And so I think that's what's happening. So if you are kind of trying to find your audience, you really have to look at the book and who it's geared towards. I will say that when we're looking at middle grade books um, that feature middle grade kids, they're probably going to appeal to boys more. Girl, girls always want to be older. My 10 year old thinks she's going on 16. And so if it's middle grade boys books, I think you're more likely to actually hit a middle grade audience. If you are looking to hit middle grade girls, then you're actually YA. And young adult fiction is technically, it's classified as anyone from 13 to 18. And then new adult is 18 to 21. And then we just have plain old adult, you know, when we stop counting our birthdays, which is 20 and up. So uh, I think you have to know your reader. It's yes, we can make blanket statements that you actually have to write up, but that's not the truth. It depends on the reader. It depends on the topic. If you've got books for reluctant readers, if you've got books for kids that don't really like to read and you're focusing on farts and nasty things and bugs and, uh, you know, that boy reluctant reader, it could be girls too, but that reluctant reader, uh, you're probably still going to be in middle grade. <laughs> so it really depends. But know your audience. Know in general. You have to have a target to hit. 
If you are just saying, I'm going to hit middle graders, well, there are reluctant readers, there are advanced readers, there are girls, there are boys, there, there are people who don't really fit into those categories or norms. And there is a target for each of them. There are books that they are more likely to want to read. And so we have to really target in on our audience profile a little bit. Um, you know, I might as well just be FBI targeting people here, um, said with complete and utter sarcasm. But you have to target because if you don't target, you're not going to hit or you're going to kind of get, it's like buckshot. Like, can I hit things? Sure. Is it going to actually do what I want it to do? Probably not. If I'm just aiming into a crowd, you really have to go for your target audience. And sometimes that means writing up. Sometimes that means that your, your middle grade characters are written for younger grades. And sometimes it means that your middle grade is middle grade, but go for your audience first and, and be honest and then put your book in whatever category it is. Your, your book is more about the vocabulary and the story and the themes than the actual characters ages, in my opinion. Would young adult also be coming of age? Um, it can be um, young adult coming of age. So you can come of age at 16. You can come of age and become a, uh, a kind of more of an adult at 16. Um, coming of age could be coming of age when you're moving from 10 to 11 and you're kind of having life experiences. So when you say coming of age, I think it can kind of, it can fit the gamut. Usually it's just any part of growing up. And Tara's saying, one part of the story is about having a first boyfriend. What age does that happen anymore? So what age level would that be appropriate for? Well, um, I will say that the, the whole boyfriend, girlfriend thing, we had kids, I volunteer at the kids' school, or I did before COVID. And um, first and second grade, kids are talking about boyfriends and girlfriends. Um, so it happens young. Sometimes there were kids in second grade whose parents were taking them on dates. Um, and meanwhile, my daughter's being told that she can have a boyfriend when she is, you know, 20. Um, so I think it runs a gamut. But the, what we considered, I wasn't allowed to date until... The, originally, it was you can't date until you're 16, but I graduated at 15, so that didn't really that didn't really work. Uh, once you're in college, like the the whole you can't date rule doesn't work very much. Um, but that is that's kind of out. People are people and kids are saying dating and boyfriend stuff very young. I will say that my 10 year old is very interested in that kind of romance of the crush, the boyfriend, the, that kind of thing. And 10, 11 is where I think we're seeing that more um, with girls for sure. And that, again, that's not middle grade, that's younger. Yeah, <laughs> great information with uh, I'm, I know I may not seem like it, but I grew up in a, like a fairly strict home and I think I'm way more lax than my parents were, but apparently I'm still, I'm still a strict mom. Oh my, this whole parenting thing, it's fun. Let's see. That's right. Well, eventually, I mean, when I pretty much told my mom I was working full time and going into college and so... If I wanted to date, I was pretty much going to date. Um, she had to agree with me at that point, I think. Like I said, I, was, I got my first full-time job at 14, and I was in college right before my 16th birthday. So we, my mom and I, we were funny. Let's see. So we answered that one. And I know... I know we still have questions, you guys. I'm not ignoring you. We were, we were chatty today. Um, but I promised in our, um, in our little reminder email that I was going to go over some cool new stuff in KDP. So I'm going to share my screen. I'm going to make good of my promise. Made you hold out. See, this is how I keep you all here. I'm like, I'll share my dog with you. And also, I'll 
tell you we're going to look at something and wait till the last five minutes. All right, my friends, this is a KDP account here. Felicia, if you've got questions, feel free to drop it in the chat and the Q&A. Um, and I will see it there. Eventually, I'll see it there. All right. So we are here and something that Amazon just did, KDP just did this week was to make HTML, HTML text formatting <clears throat> in KDP easier. So just this week, it used to be that when you were using text formatting for KDP, you had to actually have uh, HTML. You had to write it in there. We used um, a program that helped us do that. That was fantastic. But then KDP was like, hey, we can make this happen for you. So I'm going to go into this book, The 12 Dog Days of Christmas, which is awesome. It's a little short story from Paula Munet. Highly recommend. It's really short. It's super cute. And on Kindle Unlimited. And so I'm going to edit ebook details. So let's say this is pretty much if you were going to edit your book um, content, not your content, your description. And KDP is going to crawl along. And as soon as it opens up, I will show you the fabulousness. All right. So you can see we've got all this here. Let's talk about something on the way there. You can also add to a series now. So I can add series details and I can create a series. Um, you can create it and then it asks, is this main content or is this related content? I can say it's main content. And then you have to enter series details and you can go to a series and you can set it up. Super duper awesome because, I'm totally getting sidetracked, but you guys will forgive me. I just know it. So what is so cool about that is that when you set up a series, all right, so when you set up a series, it shows it. There is a series page. So when you are running ads and things, you can lead people to your series page and it lists them in order. I don't know how many times I have Googled and tried to figure out which book comes first. This puts them in order and it puts it right here where people can easily buy it. So they can easily say, oh, this is the next one that I need. It tells you how many are in the series. It gives you an overview of the series and you can buy with one click and buy all of the eBooks at one time, which is fantastic. So it's a really cool thing to have. And as you're on each book, it also has it right here. It shows the series as well. So if someone's browsing your book, they can see this is a series, which again is super cool. So series button is now available in KDP and the text formatter here. So I'm going to go down here. This, we used to have to write HTML, you know, with like the carrot. So if we wanted something bold before, I would have had to do a carrot, a B, and then another carrot, and then saying um, best story ever. And then I would have to do the carrot and then the end and the B and the that. That's a lot of work. And there are programs that do that for you. And there was a website that um, we used and it was great, but it was still extra work. And KDP finally got up with the times and we're like, hey, we're gonna make it easy for you. So now I can say, this is the best book ever because, and then I can add in a bullet point. Uh, Paula Munet wrote it. There are puppies. It's Christmas. Again, can't type, but we're not going to judge me. And then I can say, all right, well, I want this to be in bold. No problem. Um, I want to put in here Paula Munet, USA Today, best selling author. And then I need USA Today to be in italics. Great. I'm going to stick it right in there and then it's saving it so then you can have beautiful format because it's the difference of a book that looks like this where we've got some bold text in here we've got some interest we we make it lively compared to a book that just has nothing a book that has um not nearly as much let me see if i can find one so this one 
it, this may be a great book. I've never read it, but it's not as calling out to me. It doesn't have a tagline that pops. It doesn't have any visual interest or white space. And that is the difference. And that is why this is so awesome. And then you just save it, of course. So brand new from KDP. Um, just this week, which I love and adore. I think it's something everyone should take advantage of. If you don't have HTML on your book descriptions, I think that you should go do that pretty much immediately. Go play around with that, submit for um, some visual interest. Give us some white space. Give us a tagline that pops. Put it in bold. And I think that it's great that KDP has stepped up and has started doing that. Yes, and you can continue adding to the series as you have new books. So you can start with one book and add, like if you've already got a series, you can do a series and add it in. And as you write more books, you can just add in one at a time. It's awesome. And you can do side books, like if you've got short stories that come in in between, all of that. Now, if it's a series and in a spin-off series, that's two separate series. Make sure you don't put them all together. Let's see. Yes, it is looking more and more like author central, David. Um, I will say, if you, I get this question a lot. If you have your own KDP account and you are trying to change your description. Can you do it through Author Central? Yes, you can. It will take longer. It will not go as smoothly. If you own your books on KDP and you have done the upload, please go directly to KDP to change your description and all of that. It will work so much better. Um, and you will thank me later. But it's now super easy, which is awesome. All right. And we are at 11 o'clock. I did promise puppy. Uh, let me see if I can wake this big lug up. Hang on. See, he's cozy on the couch with me today. Hey, buddy. Hi, buddy. Yes, come here. We have requests for your presence, my love. Yeah. Oh, look at him. He's sleepy, guys. There's Griff. <laughs> he has grown I don't know if you remember, but when I first had him, I could like hold him and he was so tiny, but he's getting so big. And look at these massive paws. They're getting bigger and bigger. And I was very happy that um, we did not kill my dog with a poisonous plant the other day. So uh, he's still alive and very much cute. And he says, hi. He's, I've turned into that dog mom. He has an Instagram account, you guys. He does. And I am unashamed that I buy him bow ties and I put him in and I take pictures because it makes me happy. I've turned into that person. Um, it's fun. But, all right. It is the end. I'm sorry if we didn't get to the questions. We were... Um, his IG handle. It is, if you would like to follow Griff on Instagram, it is... Griffer, G-R-I-F-F-E-R, -F -F -E doodle. I will type it in. There we go. Oh, see, Tara, I'm glad you did that because I was typing, but not in the typing box. So he totally has his own. Hello. And all right, you guys, if I didn't get to your questions, I'm so sorry. Please feel free to email those in. We'll catch them next week. Um, we just had so much to talk about today. And we will talk to you next week. I hope you all have a beautiful Memorial Day weekend. Please know the New Shelves offices will be closing um, a little bit early today. And we will be off on Monday, but we will be back on Tuesday. Um, and we will see you next time. Bye, guys.